But there's something about Van Gogh's legacy which is much more important than his fathering this or that ism of modern art. Vincent's passionate belief was that people wouldn't just see his pictures, but feel the rush of life in them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. I've been looking forward to this letter, this, this response from Vincent van Gogh to his brother, to that very emotional, intense, unusually intense letter from his brother Theo from Paris while, he was in, while, while his infant son was fighting for his life while Joe was sort of moaning in her sleep and um, obviously a very uh, tense, troubled, stressful time for the family. Uh, unusually Theo complains about his employer quite bitterly, uh, you know, just that how they um, are, are sort of reining him, uh, reining him in, uh, riding, riding him in a way, and just how he's not enjoying um, the, th they're not giving him kind of credit where credit is due, that they're not treating him as a sort of veteran in the, in the art circles or whatever, and, and so there's quite a lot in that letter, and as I've said previously, Art historians, experts, pundits, and so on, point to this moment, the letters between July 1st and 2nd, as pivotal as um, basically sealing the fate of uh, Vincent, where he basically decides, well, I can't be a burden to my family, so I think I'm going to commit suicide. And it takes him about 27 days for him to, to find a gun and then um, kill himself, right? And the whole idea is to put his family out of their misery. In other words, he is making them miserable. He's a burden to them. And so he's doing it for their benefit. He's, he's doing something kind of self-deprecating. Now, um, there's an interesting theory. Um, true crime rocket science finds it absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it's not rational. It doesn't really make sense. But the most important um, thing that, that I want you to focus on is why there's absolutely no evidence of that asinine reasoning in Vincent's own letters. And I think the best, um, the best response is this letter. You know, don't take my word for it, take Vincent's word for it. Don't let me put words in his, house, uh, in his mouth. Let Vincent speak for himself. Listen to how he responds to that predicament. It's also important not to see any letter in isolation to say, okay, well, this this one word in this sentence in this letter is now the, the full story. And that is why we've been doing this for a couple of months now. We've been getting to know Vincent van Gogh. We've been getting to know Theo. We've gotten to know Theo as a fairly measured guy. He doesn't often complain. We've also gotten to know Vincent is not a very self-pitying fellow, even though he's got a lot of uh, things to deal with. Um, having said that, Vincent is quite an intense guy. He's quite an intense, in, intense person and a sensitive person. And um, so it is important to have a knowledge base on the, the people we're dealing with, not just uh, Vincent and Theo and Joe, but also Dr. Gachet, Marguerite Gachet. Um, uh, uh, the innkeeper's daughter, Adeline Ravu, and, and all the characters that are important to this. So it's important to have the complete fabric. And that is what uh, I've been trying to do through painstakingly going through um, all of these letters uh, in time, um, you know, in, in terms of the chronological time and sequentially and uh, in, in a kind of a real time scenario. Uh, uh, 130 years ago and so today the 2nd of July 130 years ago uh, Vincent wrote this response to that letter from his brother and he writes my dear Theo and dear Joe I've just received the letter in which you say that the child is ill I'd very much like to come and see you and what holds me back is the thought that I'd be even more powerless than you are in the, in the given state of distress, but I can feel how very exhausting it must be, and I would like to be able to lend a hand. 
By coming straight away, I fear I would increase the confusion. However, I share your anxieties with all my heart. Now, if you ask me, this is a very practical, reasonable, rational, uh, sensitive, kind, fair response to the question. He's basically saying, I want to come and see you. But what is holding me back is, is I'm not sure what good it will do. I mean, what can I do if your baby is, is, if your baby is struggling and your wife isn't sleeping, uh, what can I come and do? I mean, I can't. Uh, you know, I can't really do anything. And um, he's saying, um, you know, I'm I'm worried that if I do come round, I might actually increase the confusion. I might make make things worse. And so he says, I share your anxieties. Um, I do want to come see you. Um, and he's kind of waiting for them to say, look, uh, come and be with us. Um, come hold our hand or, or come and talk to us or whatever it is. And the important thing to take out of this isn't just the words, is what ultimately does happen. Does he go and see them, right? And then what happens after that? And what happens? So in other words, we, we want to look at continuity. We want to look at actions matching words and all that kind of thing, right? This isn't a situation that one would imagine that if, Van Gogh was very moved and very troubled and very hurt and very kind of um, ashamed that, that he was this terrible burden to his family. Number one, he would say, I'm coming immediately. In other words, I want to do anything I possibly can to help you, right? Instead, he's saying, I'd like to come and help you, but I'm not sure I can do much good. In other words, he doesn't feel like he's being much of a burden, Instead, he's, he's, he's thinking, well, what would make sense in the situation? I'm just saying he's not overcome emotionally that he would just rush in there and kind of in a panic and like, how can I help? Um, I don't want this child to die. You know, he's not in a tiz. He is, um, he is in control of his feelings. He's in control of his emotions. And he's also not blaming, blaming himself. And instead of actually going there, he's saying, look, I think the best... Um, Situation. I think the best thing to do is maybe if I um, stay here. I'm, I'm. You are in my thoughts, but maybe um, until this worst period is passed, maybe um, maybe I should stay here and, and I can kind of come see you later. And that does make sense. That does make sense. He's not a doctor. Um, him being there isn't going to help Joe sleep. And what is? How is his presence going to be of any use to? the baby I mean you know and besides that how is him being there going to be any use to Theo I mean maybe he can help Theo wash the dishes beyond that not much really and then he goes on to write it's a real pity that at Mr. Gachet's uh, the house is so cluttered with all sorts of things otherwise I think it would be a good plan to come and lodge here at his house with a little one, at least for a, a good month. I think that the country air has an enormous effect. So he's still offering um, his help. He's saying, you know what, maybe you should come stay here. You could, you could possibly stay at Dr. Gachet's. He calls him Mr. Gachet. And, and then he describes the house and he says it's cluttered. And, you know, we don't have a... Um, photograph of the the interior of the house we we, we don't sort of have the the benefit of a, like a body cam walkthrough but one kind of gets the sense that um, you know Dr. Gachet is a wealthy guy but he's also eccentric and the cluttered house is showing a guy who is emotionally cluttered as well and what I mean by that is you know his wife has died and so in a way he's shut down and he's sort of you know, the spider webs have started forming around um, old furniture and ancient, um, uh, not artifacts, but, but sort of, um, uh, you know, um, old furniture that is that is sort of valuable maybe. And it's kind of just piled up and, and there's, there's, a, there's an element of neglect, I think, in the house. And you often have that with widowers. They, they're still living in the past. They're still grieving. There's certain rooms they won't go into. There's certain um, 
things they can't do, they're suffering from depression, they can't sleep, and um, that is the situation here. Uh, one of the regular commenters on this uh, channel, specifically related to Van Gogh, Mr. Pictor, is very well informed. Uh, he sketches a very interesting, or he describes a very interesting routine where uh, Dr. Gachet works on certain days of the week, so he's not at home, and then other days uh, when he is at home. And obviously what that shows is a scenario where there are, are certain um, moments where Van Gogh might get a sense of, uh, how can I put it, uh, he gets a sense of feeling maybe more at home in Dr. Gachet's house than he really ought to feel. And by that I don't really mean with the furniture. So the point is he basically invites his brother to come and stay with him for the, the sake of their child, but he's saying there's not really somewhere you could stay here. And not even Vincent can kind of stay at Dr. Gachet's because the house is so cluttered. Anyway, he goes on to say, uh, in the street here, there are kids born in Paris and really sickly who are, who however are well. So he seems to be saying, um, in Auvers are children that were born in Paris really sick, but they became well when they came to Auvers. Now, I don't know whether that is uh, Van Gogh speaking from actual experience that, that he knows about this for sure, or whether he's just sort of saying something to reinforce what he's just said, uh, trying to be encouraging. He says, coming here to the inn would be possible too, it's true, so that you aren't too alone, I could come myself to stay at your place for a week or fortnight. So he's saying something, I'm not quite sure if I'm following what he's saying, but he seems to be saying, you could come and stay at the inn as well, in other words, the Ravu Inn, and... Um, and then he says something along the lines that, uh, so that you aren't too alone, I could come myself to stay at your place. So I don't know whether he's suggesting that Joe and the child almost stay in his room or something or in at the inn. And then he stays in Paris with Theo for a little while. I'm not sure if that's what he's suggesting. But it makes sense because he says that wasn't, wouldn't increase the expenses. In other words, if he's staying in Paris, in Theo's apartment, in the place of Joe, and Joe is staying in his um, room, then that wouldn't increase the expenses. He goes on to say, so just to um, re-emphasize what I said earlier, can you see how very practical and, I don't want to say business-like, but um, sensible Van Gogh is under these circumstances. He's not emotional, is not reactionary, is not blaming anyone, is not feeling sorry for himself, is trying to find a uh, practical, logical, sensible, reasonable way to deal with the situation. And is instead of being feeling burdened or whatever, he's kind of making suggestions and, you know, maybe we could do this, maybe I could do that. Um, and they, he's aware of the money situation right? And he's saying how they could kind of manage it, right? He doesn't say, you know what, maybe I should move out of this uh, room in the inn and just come and stay with you and that would decrease the expenses. He's saying, no, 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 we should keep the room. Maybe Joe should come and stay here for a while. He goes on to say, for the little one, truly I'm beginning to fear that he must be given air and especially the little bustle of the other children of a village. Surely Joe too shares our anxieties and risks. I think that from time to time she must take this distraction of the country. Now, what's quite interesting is how long ago was Vincent himself struggling with his health? How long ago was Vincent himself ill? How long was Vincent himself needing to get out in order to feel better? So it's not... Um, surprising that this is what he's suggesting. He's saying, essentially he's saying, do what I did. Come to the country. You know, get away from the bustle, get away from the, um, you know, dirty air and whatnot. Um, come to the country where it's peaceful 
and you know get a bit of rest and and you know enjoy the peaceful calm atmosphere here you know it's been good for me um it'll be good for you guys and i'm not saying that that doesn't make any sense of course we don't know what the little child is afflicted with can you imagine if the child has say um hay fever or a cough or something going to the countryside wouldn't necessarily be the best thing right um he goes on to say a rather melancholy letter from Gorgar. Now, now this is really interesting. So in the middle of his response to Theo, I just want to be explicit on this point. In the middle of his letter to Theo, it's not as though his entire letter to Theo is a sort of hysterical response to what's happened to uh, the infant baby jo uh, Vincent. It's not as though he's like so caught up in that and so overwhelmed that that's all he can talk about and think about and he's sort of running um, from pillar to post. Maybe we should do this. What about that? Um, you know what I mean? He's not um, lost his mind. He's not um, crazy, right? He's not so troubled by this that he can't think or operate. So he, he makes these suggestions, which are all fair and fine, and then he talks about something else. In the middle of his letter, he talks about something and someone else. And again, that is showing he's got perspective. He knows what's going on. He's able to, without being unkind, he's able to compartmentalize the situation, the circumstances of his brother with other things that are going on in his life. I don't mean compartmentalize to say he is not sensitive to it or he doesn't care or it doesn't matter to him just that he's able to um, uh, um, absorb it and uh, understand it and think about it and then kind of put it aside and, and talk about something else he's not overwhelmed by it and so he's, he's able to um, uh, you know, juxtapose that with something else happening with somebody else, their circumstances. And he's he uh, refers to Gorgar's letter as melancholy, a little bit subdued. I didn't really see it that way, but maybe compared to Gorgar's other letters, it, it is. Maybe Gorgar, you know, wants to do certain things and, and he knows he doesn't have the money. And so there's that aspect sort of lingering in the letter, he goes on to say, Gorgar talks vaguely of having definitely decided on Madagascar, but so vaguely that one can clearly see that he's only thinking of it because he doesn't really know what else to think about. And the execution of the plan seems almost absurd to me. He's just saying, you know, whether he's actually going to carry this out seems ridiculous. He goes on to say, there are three croquets, one of a figure of a peasant woman, Big yellow hat with a knot of um, sky blue ribbons, very red face, coarse blue blouse with orange spots, background of ears of wheat. It's a uh, number 30 canvas, but it's really a little coarse, I fear. And this is going even further away from the circumstances of Theo and Joe. So he's spoken, he's addressed them, then he talks about Gorgar with a bit of kind of regret and disappointment and you know observing that, that Gorgar himself seems melancholy or subdued and then he goes from there to talk about his own artwork. So he's not so caught up that it's like wow uh, you know I can't carry on painting because it's just such a burden I, in these circumstances. You know, you, you would think if that's what he thought, he would immediately stop. He wouldn't write um, about it. And what is kind of interesting and disappointing about um, the painting Girl Against a Background of Wheat from 1890, which is currently, I think... Um, in Las Vegas at the Bellagio Gallery of Fine Art. What is really weird about this is that um, 
he didn't identify this woman's name. I mean, it, it is actually, it's Louise Chevalier, the housekeeper. It's kind of the, I um, can't quite remember the, the words that they use in, the, in, in that context of the time. But it, it's someone who sort of chaperones and looks after the children as well. Can't quite think of the name. Uh, it's not a courtesan. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a carer. I, I just can't quite think of the the name. Um, it's just someone who sort of has um, also looks after children. I just can't quite think of the proper name for that. Uh, I'm looking through some of the um, material on it, and I just can't seem to find it. But the point is, I don't know why he doesn't refer to her by name, and I also don't know why. I'm talking about in the title of the painting and why he doesn't refer to her sort of as what she is, you know, as the sort of um, the housekeeper, the, the, the lady looking after the house when Dr. Gachet is not around. In the movie Loving Vincent, this woman seems to have a kind of a supercilious or she seems to disapprove of Vincent, like she seems to look down on her nose at him that he's uh, not trustworthy not um, you know bear in mind she's working for a, a well-to-do doctor a wealthy doctor and Vincent is kind of a smelly almost like a street a street fellow a, a street urchin not quite a street urchin but a, um, sorry, I haven't had much sleep, so I'm just struggling to put words together. But you know what I mean? Uh, kind of a ragamuffin, a uh, you know loser, a a man that's um, not not a well-to-do fellow, not a guy with good prospects. In some, not an eligible bachelor, and certainly not someone that she probably would like to see her charges around. There are actually two. I think it's the younger son Paul and then also um, Marguerite Gachet and she, she probably doesn't like this uh, scruffy fellow the scruffy smelly random fellow kind of um, you know moving in and out the house it's her place kind of thing you know and, and maybe she's got to clean up after him and all that kind of thing but think about where we are now. He has painted Adeline Ravu. He has painted Marguerite Gachet. And now he's even painted the housekeeper. So it's almost like three in a row. You know, he's painted three women, not necessarily in, in a row, because um, uh, he probably may have painted something in between. But in a very short period, he's painted three women. And he might be warming up to the subject. He might be thinking, well, I, I'm enjoying painting women. I'm enjoying looking at them. I'm enjoying talking to them. And one must also ask, did Louis Chevalier kind of condescend to pose? Did, um, did Vincent ask her and she said, sure? Or did the doctor kind of order her? Because she's his employee. She, um, you know, she might have, someone might, might she, she may have been told, yes, you will pose for Vincent. That's it. And whether she liked it or not, she's kind of staring into the middle distance, quite stiff in, in both the uh, portraits that he did of her. Just sort of, you know, she's not looking at him. She's just sort of um, almost like she's waiting for the time to go by so she can get up and continue with her work. In other words, does she see, does she respect him? Does she respect his artwork? Does, does she think that um, he has much potential, right? Bearing in mind at the moment he's a commercial failure. So, so does she think it's worth her while doing this? Now, what's quite interesting when you look at the picture where she's backgrounded by wheat, she's got very red, a red, very red um, sort of face. And maybe that's who he was referring to when he referred earlier to a woman wearing dark clothes with a very red face. Do you remember that description? I'm just wondering whether that is not the same person. 
And then there's another picture of her where she's wearing kind of a white dress, the same yellow hat, um, same basic orientation, but then she's wearing a white dress and the colors behind her are more of a kind of a soft green. And even in that letter, she's sort of staring into the middle distance. Now, what's interesting with this particular portrait is I think it's much better than the one of Adeline Revue and Marguerite Gachet. It's just, um, it's, a, it's a better executed portrait by far. Now, before I return to the letter, I just want to play a very brief clip from Loving Vincent, which quotes Louis Chevalier saying the following about Vincent. Always skulking about. Quiet man. Always skulking about. He was a nice, quiet man. Always skulking about. He was a nice, quiet man. Always skulking about. So there you get two contrasting, um, contradicting uh, descriptions of Van Gogh by these two characters in the film. You have Adeline Revu talking fondly of him in a certain way. Bearing, bear in mind that um, he would just sort of eat and sleep there. So he would just sort of be there kind of in the morning for breakfast and in the evening for dinner and otherwise you didn't, they didn't really see him. <laughs> Whereas um, the housekeeper kind of experienced him in a different way. She had to clean up after him potentially all day, bearing in mind he's a painter, so there would be quite a lot of mess probably a lot of the time. And... I do think he was skulking about. I mean, he was often at the at the gachets. Um, he was skulking about. He certainly wasn't skulking about the Revue Inn. He would leave the Revue Inn to skulk about other places. One of those places was Dr. Gachet's home. How does a man go from being absolutely calm to suicidal in six weeks? And so that's another dramatization which is in the trailer of Loving Vincent where the postman uh, talks in the movie about how he knows Vincent and, and he says, how, how could he go from this normal dude to suicidal in six weeks? And I don't think it's even six weeks. I mean, right now there are four weeks left on the clock and he hasn't been not calm in the last couple of weeks and he's certainly not not calm now in terms of his response to his brother he's calm he's rational he's normal so he is, how does he now go from that to suicidal in four weeks and we're going to continue going through the letters and we will see that he's not becoming less calm in the next couple of weeks so what really happened if he didn't commit suicide what really happened he was mad. He was an interesting man. He was a genius. So if we return to the letter, he talks about the horizontal landscape with the fields, a subject like one of Michel's, but then the coloration is soft green, yellow and green blue. Then the undergrowth, violet trunks of poplars, which cross the landscape perpendicularly like columns. The depths of the undergrowth are blue and under the big trunks the flowery meadow, white, pink, yellow, green, long russet grasses and flowers. So he's now calm enough to really talk very uh, clearly and descriptively and specifically about his artworks. That's how much perspective he's got and how much calm he has in his mind and his heart about what is happening. He goes on to write, The people here at the inn used to live in Paris. There they were constantly indisposed, parents and children. Here they never have anything, and especially not the littlest one, which came here when he was two months old. And then the mother had difficulty in suckling him, while here all of that went well almost immediately. So this is quite interesting. I said earlier, you know, how would he know about children, you know, how children are doing and so on, and here's the answer. The answer is he has obviously discussed the news of his family with the people at the inn and they've said 
probably recommended, you know, why, is, why don't they come here? Uh, this is what happened when we came here. Um, they should come here. Maybe they've also suggested, why don't you go and stay with your brother and, and uh, we'll look after Joe and, and the child kind of thing, right? So that kind of addresses that and it just shows to, some, to what extent Vincent ha has started developing a little bit of a community around him, um, people who are re respond when something's going on with his family. So he is starting to feel quite at home. He is surrounded by some good people, certainly at the inn. And, um, and maybe that is why he's quite comfortable and he's, he's quite sensible and he's quite healthy and he's quite happy. He goes on to say, um, in another respect, you work all day long and at the moment you're probably hardly sleeping. This is a reference to Theo. I'd willingly believe that Joe would have twice as much milk here and that then when, they, when she came here, one could do without cows, donkeys and other quadrupeds. And as for Joe, so that during the daytime she has company, my word, she could also go and stay just opposite Père Gachet. Perhaps you remember that there's an inn just opposite at the bottom of the slope. So it's quite funny kind of interesting that he, he kind of says you know what if joe came to the countryside she would be able to produce twice as much milk in other words she would be able to nour provide nourishment to the infant kind of herself they wouldn't need to go to <laughs> you know and the way he puts it is quite funny cows donkeys and other quadrupeds um you know it's almost like well i can't I can't breastfeed you. Oh, there's a cow. Let, let's, let's, you know, uh, let's, oh, there's a cow. There's a donkey walking down the road. Get him. You know, um, so he's kind of saying, you know, if she came out here to the country, you wouldn't even need the cows. Um, she would, you know, be able to, she'd be healthy enough to be able to look after him herself. And, and then there's also Dr. Gachet. You know, why don't you use our doctor? Why don't you use my doctor? He could make sure everything's fine. So he sort of drifted back to talking about that after talking about his own art. Then he says, what do you want me to say as regards the future? Perhaps, perhaps without the boussards. What will be, will be. You haven't spared yourself trouble for them. You've served them with exemplary fidelity all the time. Now he's talking about Theo's employer. Now, bear in mind, all of this is still very measured, very sensible, very reasonable, very rational. Something say, somebody saying what will be, will be, isn't um, the sort of vocabulary a madman would use, is it? He goes on to say, I too am trying to do as well as I can, but I don't hide from you that I scarcely dare count on always having the necessary health. And this, I think, is something that would raise the alarm bells of the art scholars where they would do cartwheels and say, Yeah, it is! This is, the, this is the moment where we can see that Van Gogh can't hold it together. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a nutball, a mad uh, hatter. You know, uh, he, has, he has your evidence. But again, this is taking a random fragment out of a letter and waving it like a giant flag and saying, This is it. Because the counter to that is to say, Obviously, he's going to feel that he can't um, expect, he can't feel entitled to health after he's been sick kind of for a year. After he's been in the asylum for a year and, and he's definitely had problems there. He's had problems sleeping, he's had problems working, he's had problems concentrating. He's, he's certainly had problems and, and I think it's from uh, advanced syphilis. Um, I don't think it got to the stage, or I think it was almost getting to the stage of neurosyphilis, but I don't think it was quite there. And so, knowing what we know, it made complete sense for him to say, I don't know if I can count on being healthy um, forever after. And that was true. Because we know what happened to, Th to Theo. We know that Theo died six months later. So 
you can apply what he's saying about himself. Now, bear in mind, let's say Vincent didn't die then. How long would he have lived foreseeably? And the answer is perhaps six more months, perhaps as long as Theo, perhaps longer than Theo because he rested for the past year or something like that. Um, it's hard to say. Perhaps another year, perhaps another three years, who knows. But I think he's spot on by saying, I uh, I can't hide from, from you that I scarcely dare count on always having the necessary health. At the moment, he's got health. At the moment, he, he's almost in a better position health-wise and stress-wise than his brother, his sister-in-law and their child. But he, he's saying... You know, it's not guaranteed. I, it might change. I don't know. And he's right. It's going to change for Theo very soon. I think Theo's health was already deteriorating at this point. And then he goes on to say, And if my illness recurred, you would excuse me. I still love art and life very much. But as to ever having a wife of my own, I don't believe in it very strongly. Now this, once again is something that your art critics and art historians and experts so-called would pounce on where, where he says um, you know if, if my illness ever occurred you would excuse me oh does that mean he would say if, if I get sick again w would you excuse me while I die I don't think that's what he's saying he's saying you know despite being ill I still love art and life very much and I just find this absolutely ridiculous that a month before he supposedly commits suicide, he's telling his brother, I still love life very much. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. You know, he's going out every day and painting the countryside around him. He's engaging with the people around him. He's not lying in bed all day, moaning and groaning. You know, he's, he's doing, he's doing. And, you know, here he is um, four weeks out saying, Explicitly, his own words, I still love life very much. He's, he's, he's fighting for his life. He's, he's, he's fighting to continue his craft. He's pursuing his calling. He's doing what he wants to do. He's a man with purpose, a man who's motivated. right? And he says, under these circumstances, I don't know if I am ever going to have a wife. And that, that's also very interesting. So a month before his death, he's talking about, he's talking to his brother about, because uh, his brother in the previous letter said, you know, I hope you find a wife like I have, you know, a, a great woman like Joe. I hope you find someone like her because it'll bring you great happiness. And Vincent's saying, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen for me. I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know if I believe in it very strongly. I don't know if I believe in marriage very strongly. And um, I'm not sure what he means, but I don't know whether he, he means I can't keep a wife because I've got no money or women aren't interested in me or, um, you know what, I've got a wandering eye I'm, I, or I want to play the field or I want to play in the fields. I don't know. But um, this is what he's addressing. I don't think it's defeatist what he's saying. He's saying, you know, what I love is art and life is not really kind of including a wife in that or wanting a wife in that he goes on to say I fear rather that towards let's say the age of 40 but let's not say anything I declare that I know nothing absolutely nothing of what turn it may yet take he seems here to be talking about um, when I'm 40 years old I don't know whether I'll be married that seems to be what he's saying and he says let's not say anything Presumably, for example, to their mother, to other women, to other people, because to be respectable in that time and even to some extent in this time, 130 years later, you know, aren't you a more respectable person if you married, if you have children, if you have kind of a, a family unit, you know, you are a respectable family man, you're a respectable um, part of a family, part of a whatever, right? Any sort of man on his own is, is treated with a little bit of suspicion. Why are you on your own? Are you, are you a pedophile? Are you gay? Are you weird? Are you mad? 
Are you difficult? Are you depressed? What is your problem? Like, why are you on your own, right? That has diminished to some extent in our time, th those kinds of questions. But there's a, a totally different thing, you know, often when you have young people, they kind of excoriated, they often told by the parents, when are you going to get married? And when they get married, when are you going to have children? And the whole idea is that that is the natural state to which human beings must gravitate. I'm just saying that is how it has been for a long time. It's kind of changed to some extent now. Um, there are more single people now. It's kind of more normal to be unmarried or divorced or a singleton post-divorce or whatever. And this is what Van Gogh's thinking about. He's thinking about having a wife and whether he believes in it while he's painting all these women. It's in his mind. It's in his heart. His brother is with a woman. He's not. And where he is in the countryside, these women are sort of floating around him. What must I do about this? Should I do something about this? Um, is it enough that I love art and life? Should I find, should I try and like get a girlfriend? Meanwhile, he's floating around Dr. Gachet's house, skulking, as the housekeeper says, and she doesn't like it. What is she seeing? Is she seeing him glancing at Marguerite, and is there sort of a hooded look in his eye where he's thinking, you know, maybe I should get married, or you know, I wonder if she would marry me, or um, I wonder if there's someone in this town who would marry me. Uh, I wonder if there's some nice, if, wonder where the nearest brothel is. Anyway, he goes on to say, um, I, and, and he, I think uh, uh, another point to, to make is he's talking about turning 40. So he didn't turn 37 years old that long ago. His brother also had a birthday not that long ago. And now he's talking about when he's 40 years old. Now, he's clearly thinking that he's going to reach the age of 40, which is three years away. So why on earth would he commit suicide? Why on earth would he have a change of heart from, oh, I wonder what will happen when I'm 40 years old to, uh, I think I'm going to kill myself now. Can you see how it doesn't make any sense? Can you also see how the Van Gogh Museum and his art scholars and art historians and the media are pushing a narrative that doesn't make sense and that's illogical, but most important, it simply doesn't resonate with Van Gogh's own words. Can you see that? And this is the mainstream version of what everybody is led to believe. It's just not true. He finishes off the letter saying, But I'm writing to you at once that as regards the little one, I think you, must, you mustn't worry yourselves excessively. Okay. That's... The bottom line in terms of this letter is he's saying what you've said is kind of urgent, it's important, I understand kind of what you're going through, but maybe you shouldn't worry too much. And what ultimately happened? The infant child didn't die. I mean, of all of them, I think the infant child ultimately lived fairly happily ever after. So Vincent was right. Don't worry excessively about what's going on now. He was right. He wasn't overly worried. He wasn't panicking. He wasn't blaming himself. He's actually minimizing it and not in a patronizing way or an um, uneducated or uninformed way saying, guys, maybe you're overreacting just a little bit. Just this too will pass. It's tough. Uh, raising a, a child, you know, you do have these stressful moments. I can tell you, um, at my feet right now, I've got a puppy. I've had very stressful moments with him. In fact, I had one today where he swallowed a coin. Um, I think it was a 20 cent coin. And I was very worried. Um, you know, I immediately called the breeder, actually. And she told me, something that reassured me immediately. She said, you know what, my daughter swallowed um, a coin, her child, and they rushed her child to a doctor, and the doctor said, 
don't worry, I think it'll come out naturally. Although if she has problems, she must come bring her in immediately. And she didn't have problems. And they took an x-ray and they could actually see where the coin was in her body. I don't know for sure that they took an x-ray and then there was no coin. They may have. I can't quite say that for sure. But, but she was okay. And hearing that kind of totally reassured me. I, I thought any moment now this dog's going to have convulsions, not be able to, he's going to choke or whatever. You know, he's going to sort of walk and then kind of freeze and then sort of, you know, keel over. And so I was really worried. But I was also reassured quite quickly and the reassurance made sense. And I have sort of sat quivering with the dog on my lap all day. I've taken him for a walk and he's fine so far. So I am a little bit concerned because it's, you know, the coin might still be in him and something could still happen. But I'm um, sort of fairly confident that it's not the end of the world that, that these things happen and that he is likely to be okay. She also phoned her father who's a veterinar veterinarian and he also said um, it should come out naturally. It's not, it's not like... Um, uh, you know the end of the world it's it's normal uh they're birds that eat stones and they don't die you know they they actually use it for dige digestion so in any event i mean you must think of the gullet almost as like kind of a long sl sludgy pipeline that can handle fairly big objects certainly not um infinitely large but um it can can handle fairly big objects so i'm just saying there are um, urgent situations that aren't emergencies and the question isn't so much um, what's going on in the situation but how does a person react to them and what does that say about that person yeah it's an amazing opportunity to gauge Van Gogh's temperament his personality his intelligence his mindset, all of those things under these uh, circumstances that are actually um, pushing Theo kind of to the edge, where, where Theo's getting grouchy and he's blaming his employer and so on. And how is Vincent responding? And he, he writes a really nice letter. It's supportive. He offers suggestions. He talks a little bit about what's going on with him. He talks a little bit about getting a wife himself. And he ends it off with a reassurance saying, you know what, I don't think you should worry excessively about this. And he signs off saying, if it's that he's teething, well, to make the task e easier for him, perhaps we could distract him more here where there are children, animals, flowers and good air. I shake your hand and Joe's firmly in thought and kiss the little one. Ever yours, Vincent. And then there's a postscript to his letter. He writes, Thank you for the consignment of colors, for the 50 franc note, and for the article on the independence. An Englishman, Australian, called Walpole Brook will probably come to see you. He lives at 16 Rue de la Grande Chumere. Ch Chumere. <laughs> not, sure, not sure how to pronounce it. And he says, I told him that you would let him know a time when he could come and see my canvases that, that are at your place. He'll probably show you some of his studies, which are still rather lifeless, but however he does observe nature. He has been here in Auvers for months, and we went out together sometimes. He was brought up in Japan. You would never think so from his painting, but that may come. And so this is the four-page letter written by Van Gogh. And it ends off, interestingly, the, the, the letter ends off with Van Gogh sort of thanking him for sending money and for another consignment of colors. He doesn't say, which is kind of what these art critics are getting at, that Vincent realized, oh shit, I'm a terrible burden to my brother. I'm so, you know, he can't afford to look after me. Uh, I'm so expensive. He doesn't have any money. Um, so I'm going to kill myself and that's going to save my brother money. Instead he says, thanks for the consignment of colors and thank you for the 50 franc note. And by the way, this other guy's going to come see you and he'll talk to you about art and whatever. So there's no interruption to this idea of 
Vincent doing art, right? So what we want to look at over the next couple of days is, does he have a change of heart? Does he say, oh shit, you know what? I think I'm going to stop painting or don't send me any more money or maybe I should stop painting for a while until you have more money or maybe he writes him a letter saying, do you have any money? Do you have a financial problem? Am I causing you a financial problem? So this has been a kind of a, I don't want to say bump in the road, but this has been a bit of a stressful hinge in, in, in the timeline. And, and now it's going to kind of continue over the next month and the next couple of weeks. And what we want to observe is how does it manifest? Does Vincent become depressed? Does he become cynical? Does he start arguing with people or blaming people? Does he start feeling sorry for himself? Does he start to pay more attention to the woman around him? How does Dr. Gachet respond? What happens? How does Theo deal with the sickness of his family? And probably most important of all, what does Vincent do? Does he go and see his family? Because one could argue that if he doesn't, he's actually quite a, an arsehole. He's quite a, a reckless guy, a, a selfish person. So the question is, is he a man of his word? Does he go and see his family and, and make sure that they're okay? And th that is what we're going to deal with in the next letters. Thanks for listening to this episode. Uh, I think you can agree with me that it, it's getting um, quite uh, intense now. And um, it's also, you can feel the tragedy mounting, can't you? So... Um, if you haven't subscribed yet to this channel, please do. You're welcome to leave a comment. You're welcome to uh, leave questions or uh, observations. Um, Mr. Picture, you're always welcome to add your two cents. Um, and uh, I'll see you guys next time.